Welcome everyone to the 2021 CEPR Economic Summit. I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and I'm thrilled that you're able to join us for the first day of the summit. We'll be hearing from Melody Hobson in just a few minutes, but I first wanted to welcome and thank you all for tuning in today and to remind you about what we have in store for this week-long event. Whether you've been joining us for our online events during the past year or are with us today for the first time, I know you'll find the summit to be an exciting and engaging chance to dig into some important economic policy issues. And if you're a veteran of our economic summits, which we started holding all the way back in 2003, I sincerely hope that you find the way that we've designed this year's online experience still allows for some of the networking and camaraderie that is really a hallmark of these events. And I hope we are all able to gather in person for next year's summit. Our lineup of speakers and panelists include some incredibly knowledgeable and influential scholars, business leaders, and policymakers. I'm very, very grateful that they'll be joining us this week. I know that this has been an incredibly challenging year for everyone. Our lives at home, at work, and in our communities have been upended by the pandemic. And I'm incredibly proud of the faculty and the students affiliated with us at CEPR who have been producing research and analysis in response to the economic shifts in the United States and around the world. Their scholarships helps policymakers at the federal, state, and local level here in the US and all around the world work through some difficult decisions about economic recovery, vaccine distribution, and how the healthcare system responds to the COVID-19 crisis. We've also been focusing on a wide range of other economic issues. And with the new presidential administration settling in and setting a new economic course for the country, CEPR's mission of catalyzing and promoting research that has a meaningful impact on policymaking is as timely and important as ever. This week's summit will address many of the most pressing economic issues that governments, businesses, and everyday people are dealing with. I'm looking forward to hearing what Melody Hobson has to say about financial literacy and investment in just a little bit. And tomorrow's panel on competition and regulation in big tech will tackle a major issue with tremendous impact. On Wednesday, We'll have Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella joining us in a fireside chat with Jeff Rakes, who is now the chair of Stanford's Board of Trustees. We'll be talking about what's in store for college sports on Thursday. And on Friday, Raphael Bostic, the president of the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank and a PhD graduate from our economics department, will be delivering our closing keynote. They'll all be joined throughout the week by Stanford faculty members, making for an exciting mix of scholarship, policy insight, and business leadership. In addition to those sessions, which will all be broadcast live on YouTube, we're also hosting a series of exclusive sessions for our CEPR associates that dig even deeper into issues around the challenges and promises of California's economy, the digital economy and the future of work, global development, tech policy, and monetary policy. CEPR associates can learn about all of these sessions on the summit portal. And if you're joining us on YouTube, you can find the full agenda and more information on our summit website at cepersummit2021.stanford.edu. Before I welcome Melody Hobson, I wanna say how honored and grateful I am to have so many outstanding speakers with us throughout the week. And a huge thank you again for all of your support and a special thanks to Dodge and Cox and to Hydric and Struggles for being the summit's corporate sponsors. With that, I'm very happy to now introduce Melody Hobson. She and I will be talking for about 40 minutes, and then we'll take some time to address the questions that you can submit at any time during the session. Melody is the co-CEO and president of Ariel Investments, a money management firm specializing in small and mid cap stocks. Melody is in charge of the management, strategic planning and growth for all of Ariel's areas outside of research and portfolio management. Melody literally came up through the ranks at Ariel, starting there as a college intern. She's been there for almost 30 years and spent two decades as the firm's president before being named co-CEO. And as if she didn't already have enough to do, Melody is also starting a new position this month, I believe perhaps today, as the chair of Starbucks Board of Directors after having served as the board's vice chair for some time. She's also a director of JP Morgan Chase and has served as chairman of the board of DreamWorks Animation. She's been named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world and I can go on and on for the entire next hour listing Melody's many accomplishments. But one of the things she's really quite passionate about is financial literacy. That's something that stems from her childhood, being raised as the youngest of six children by a single mom 
who often had a hard time making ends meet despite her hard work and her entrepreneurship. So maybe that's a good place for us to begin our conversation. Melody, welcome to the CEPR Economic Summit and thank you so much for joining us and for helping us start things off. Thank uh, you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Well, uh, why don't we, we uh, you get us started uh, by um, talking a bit about how you came to realize the importance of financial literacy, how it impacted your own life and your career decisions, and then we can go uh, from there. So uh, I'll let you go with, with that <laughs> to okay. start. Thanks. I, you gave a little bit of the reasons and the, the root of my interest in financial literacy. It really goes back to when I was a child. I tell people it's not an accident I work in the investment business because as a child, I was desperate to understand money, desperate. And I use the, one, the word understand intentionally. I don't say make, I don't say have, I say understand because I thought if I understood money, then I would be able to break the cycle that I felt that I was in. I grew up the youngest of six kids, as you mentioned. My mom was a single mom, despite Herculean efforts on her part. She often had a hard time making ends meet. And because of that, which I have told many times, we often would get evicted or our phone would get disconnected, our lights would be turned off. It's really interesting to have those experiences as a child. My husband says, whatever happens to you as a child really stays with you because you don't have any advanced reasoning skills. So that feeling of financial insecurity dominated my life as a child, dominated. And as a result of that, I wanted to have a clear sense of how money worked so that I could get that out of my consciousness as this overwhelming sense of peril and anxiety. And so this issue around financial literacy, once I started working at Ariel as a summer intern and discovered this whole area of money and investing, I felt liberated. I felt that I had been given this gift of understanding and I wanted to give it to other people. And then I realized the construct of our society that doesn't really make that possible. And that is a fa the fact that in high school in America today, you can take wood shop or auto and not take a class on investing which always leads me to ask people who's cleaning their own carburetors or whittling in their spare time, no one. And so this financial literacy issue, if you don't grow up in a home where money and the stock market and investing is discussed, you're literally behind the eight ball, which is why this financial literacy issue is so crucial to our society. Thanks so much for that. And uh, Melody, as I had mentioned, uh, before today, I'm teaching this quarter uh, Ecom One, and you know I try in that class to help uh, my students get get a little more financial literacy. But you know Stanford uh, fr first years are not exactly a representative sample of 18 year olds throughout the country. Um, and I'm just curious, how do you think that we can ensure that financial literacy is something that's taught to and learned by people from all economic backgrounds and ages, not just like let's say Stanford. Uh, Ecom one uh, students or in the run up to, to Stanford, especially those who might be economically disenfranchised for a variety of reasons. Well, one thing I would say it's super interesting and certainly your students are not typical of society. Uh, but what I would say is I've talked to many people who have gone as far as getting MBAs from major universities, the top schools and said, I still wasn't taught about the stock market or investing. And I found myself going into my first job without really being able to make decisions around something as basic as the investments in my 401k plan. So while economics is obviously a great, great place to par start, there are some fundamentals that are still really important and making sure that people understand the basics of you know, 30 stocks in the Dow, what the NASDAQ is, the S&P, how it all works in a way that again has profound implications for not only for their own life and livelihood, but for the family that they may have one day. And to the extent that people don't understand these issues, they become a burden on society and therefore become all of our problems. And that's where we all see our taxes go up and the like, where society must insulate and, and protect on the downside for that lack of knowledge. So what can be done? This one's really tough and I'm not one to just admire problems, but this one's really hard because the US government cannot mandate financial literacy on a national basis. It's a state issue. And so on a state by state basis, municipalities, school districts of which there are thousands of them have to take up this cause themselves. 
And I know this firsthand because the former Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, used to run our foundation at Ariel, the Ariel Education Initiative, before he was head of the Chicago Public School System. So he worked in earnest to try to have this happen, make this happen, but our, our legal structure in the US government does not allow it. So what can we do? We have to advocate as individuals. And I tell people, if you have nieces or nephew, if you have children, if you have, uh, any tie to any school or school system, you could say you want these, this subject matter taught in school so that the students will be better off. And to the extent we can have volunteers that come from the financial community. You mentioned Dodge and Cox is one of your sponsors, which is an organization that I know really well and is so well respected. To the extent that organizations like Dodge and Cox and Ariel and others decide we're gonna take up this cause, we can go into schools and help uh, and even elementary school students start to really understand the basics of money and investing. That's terrific. Thanks so much. I had a problem um, unmuting there for a second. Uh, you know, one, one thing I just wanted, I do want to throw a shout out to the economics profession on this front, because one area of research that economics has helped on is on uh, having companies set as the default to sign up their workers for 401k plans. So it used to be that you had to like take the extra step if you were an employee to fill out the paperwork and sign up. But now um, some research by economists showed that it could have a powerful impact on participation in these plans if companies just assumed you were in. In other words, you had to opt out and that made a huge difference. So, um, you know, that's one of the things, uh, you know, my economics profession where we're not always uh, uh, realizing our potential, but that's one front I, on which I feel like we've made a, made a difference. That has made a huge difference in participation and participation rates have gone up dramatically. We've also seen differences between ethnic groups get narrowed because of that opting out feature that you have to say, no, I don't want to belong. And inertia is a really, really great thing. However, there's a shortcoming to this and that is auto enrollment, which is what that is called, can be improved with auto escalation, meaning when you auto enroll someone, you set them at a default amount that is going to come out of their paycheck. If that number doesn't go up over time, they stay at that low level, oftentimes too low to even get the company match. And so we would say you want to not only put them in the plan, but every year as they get a, a raise, the cost of living goes up, et cetera, you adjust just ever so slightly automatically. And again, they have to opt out. So that auto enrollment allows them to put away and save and invest more over time. That's great. Uh, so I, I don't know if there have been uh, studies estimating that, but I, I'm going to try to inspire the people who work in that orbit to, to look at those effects. So now CEPR has for almost 30 years now worked with high school economics teachers, mainly here in California. Um, and the program was started because uh, California around 30 years ago started to require economics to graduate from high school. And so uh, do you think that, so you, is it your sense that high schools are the, are the optimal place to really make a, a big effort on this front? I think grade schools are the optimal place, actually, um, but high schools are as good as anything. And the reason I say grade schools is my idea is that money becomes a language for a child. It's actually one of the only things other than your family that you're going to have a relationship with your whole life. And so the idea of, of really getting smart about money very, very early on, especially with children, is something I think is like teaching a child a language at a very young age. We know the younger they are, the more fluent they become because their brains just adjust to the nomenclature and the language. We want them to have that language of money at a very young age. We think it's very, very important because money has become more elusive than ever as a concept for young people by virtue of credit cards, the way we buy and spend money over um, you know, uh, the internet, et cetera, it doesn't have the finality to it the way one would think. Many parents tell me all the time that when they tell their children they can't afford something, they will say to them, use a credit card or go to an ATM. And think if you're five, six, seven years old and you see an ATM, a machine just spit money out, you don't have a sense of how it all works. And so our whole point of view is to be able to treat, teach the basics of money and investing to children actually becomes the game changer. 
And it has an added benefit in that those grade school children are getting homework that their parents may not know or understand. And so it creates a ripple effect in the family as the, the, the child really becomes the gateway to the parent around this issue of saving and investing as well. Well, that's great. And you know, it's interesting because I think back to when I was a kid, I had a paper route uh, when I was, let's say, 10, 11 years old. And it was a very different time. It was the early uh, 1980s. And I mean, the stock market stuff now, I think, is even more important. Back then, I used to get the satisfaction of going to the local savings bank and I would see interest accumulating. Yeah. So that back then, interest rates, I mean, it was not a great time because inflation was high, but I could see the return to my savings, whereas now the traditional savings aren't really yielding much uh, for people. So it's really important to get more people uh, invested in the market so that they can realize uh, you know, better returns. Than well, not only that, also just you know, the one thing that young people have on their side is time. It's the greatest gift that you have when it comes to compounding. And right. so you can live out all the ups and downs of the market very, very comfortably. And even little bits of money make a difference over time. Right, absolutely. Wow, well, that's great. So I wanna pivot a little bit uh, to talk about the fact that you know, you're a black woman leading a major investment firm and sitting at the helm now of a Fortune 500 company. And this has historically been, and to a, to a large extent still now, a space occupied by white men. And I, I'm curious to hear just your thoughts on how you see corporate power changing. Um, and, and so wait, maybe you can get, get us, start off with that. It's changing very slowly, unfortunately. I'm not quite yet chair of Starbucks, but I will be at our annual meeting, which is coming up very, very soon this month. Um, but let's just put that in perspective. When I become the chairman of the board of Starbucks, I will be the only black woman who's chair of a Fortune 500 company. That is nuts. I, I say this you know, with so much humility. I think I'm talented and smart, but I think there are some other smart people out there too. Some other black women, some other black men. Like this makes no sense that this is the situation we're in. Last week, Tasunda Duckett, who's a brilliant woman who was inside of JP Morgan Chase, where I'm on the board, it was announced that she will become the CEO of TIAA. She will be only the second Black woman right now running a Fortune 500 company. Roz Brewer, who just left Starbucks with me, is going to be the CEO of Walgreens. She's the, she will be, she was announced a, a few weeks ago. Now to Sunda. Now you would say, well, there's a trend too. You know, <laughs> Two, two out of 500. In terms of black leaders of Fortune 500 companies, five. There may be six. But I mean, like, you know, this is just not great math. And as I like to say to people all the time, math has no opinion. The math tells us everything that we need to know. So while I'm certainly gratified in this opportunity that I've been given, this is woefully inadequate as a society. I have a friend, Lewis Hamilton, who's a great Formula One race car driver, seven-time champion. And he says, being the first black anything is a proud and lonely walk. And I said, it's just a, it's a brilliant concept because those two countervailing uh, emotions are really true. You're proud of what you've done, but it's lonely. You're there by yourself. So I think corporate America is having a, having a real moment right now. I've been calling this civil rights 3.0, 1.0 being the Emancipation Proclamation, 2.0 being the issues that we had in the 1960s around the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the progress that was made then with the King years. And then 3.0 right now was the summer of unrest because of the, the murders of so many innocent people that we know that happens every single day. George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, all so many others, Breonna Taylor and the like, where America really saw firsthand with video how brutal the system can be for people of color and where it has landed in terms of accountability is at the feet of corporate America. Corporate America is now being held accountable for statements that they make, actions that they take by their employees, by their vendors, and by the broader society because of the viral nature of the environment that we live in with social media and the internet. Yeah, and on that note, I, I completely agree with you that the uh, business leadership in America is not nearly uh, where it should be on diversity. And I'll also say that my profession, economics, we're not where we should be, but I'm very proud to, and I'm guessing you know this, that 
uh, professor and the Dean of Princeton's School of Public Policy, Cecilia Rouse, a black woman. She is uh, slated to be the next chair of President uh, Biden's Council of Economic Advisors. And I worked for uh, Professor Rouse, Cece, when I was at the Council of Economic Advisors back in 2009 and 2010. And I'm so proud of her and happy for the country that she's there in that role because I think it will make a difference um, for a lot of people. I um, totally agree with you. And this is an exciting time. Again, a lot of firsts, a lot of proud and lonely moments. Obviously, you've got Treasury with Janet Yellen. You've got so many other examples. And Cecilia Rouse is a great example. But it's 2021. I mean, it's pretty remarkable that we're this far along in our country's history and we're still uh, looking at these kind of uh, statistics and looking at these kind of firsts. So while I'm super encouraged and what I say all the time, and you know this because of the students that you teach, talent and genius do not discriminate. They don't. But for whatever reason, we don't see the, the proportionate amount of talent and genius in corporate America that exists in all communities in our country. So on this note, you know, you're know you going to be going to uh, the chair of uh, Starbucks uh, board. And I'm curious how the notion of who's in charge you think affects the sort of typical consumer who's going to Starbucks ordering, you know, a coffee or a latte or what have you. It's one of, it's probably the, my daughter's and my favorite place to go to Starbucks to get, uh, to get, uh, you know, not always the healthiest things, but, but we, we love to go there. But I'm curious, just, you know, as you, as you get ready to take the helm in this important role, how do you think it affects uh, consumers? Uh, Leadership matters in every way. And when you talk about a consumer, consumer products company like Starbucks, it's the whole idea of feeling like you belong somewhere, feeling like you are, uh, you are welcome in an environment and leadership sets that tone and creates that culture. You know, Howard Schultz, when he talks so frequently and boldly about leading the company through the lens of humanity, having humanity as the goal and humanity means that all people are represented. And so that's not just behind the counter, it's district managers, it's in the C-suite, et cetera. Because when all those people are there, I strongly believe, and I've seen it to be true. You talked about Satya Nadella speaking later in the week. He's on the Starbucks board. We probably have one of the most diverse boards in the world. When you bring that kind of diversity together, you get better outcomes. So not only a more inclusive environment, but smarter decisions get made. And so who's in charge is everything. It doesn't have to mean that that person is a black person or Latinx, et cetera, but it means that whoever that person is, they're inclusive in their thinking about other people's perspectives and points of view, and they are soliciting them, not thinking that they have the best answer or leading only through their own personal experience. That's great. Thanks uh, so much for that. So on the on the notion of uh, board composition, so California, I'm, I'm guessing you know about this, has recently enacted a rule about board composition. And can you say a bit about that? And do you think there should be mandates? And uh, and what would be the effects of, of, of different sorts of mandates? I thought the California rule was very bold. So Jerry Brown was the one who originally did it. And he said, at the time, 25% of California companies had no people of color or women on their boards. 25% were all white male boards in California. So Jerry Brown decided that he would actually legislate around the issue. At the time, publicly, he said, and you can read this in articles, he knew it would be challenged in the court and maybe not live through the challenge, but he wanted to make a statement. And I think that's the exact right thing. You have to put a stake in the ground around these issues and again, decide if you're going to be a great fiduciary, being a great fiduciary means having an inclusive boardroom because that inclusive boardroom leads to better outcomes for the shareholders. And that is a fact. The math stands behind that a more diverse board leads to better outcomes. We have that you know, plain and simple. So I think that it was absolutely the right thing. Um, in terms of being very bold and courageous. Do I think that that will take on a life of itself around the country? I'm not so sure. Do I think our US government would do something like that? 
not likely, despite the fact that in Europe we've seen mandates in, in the UK and France, et cetera, around specifically gender diversity on boards. They have mandates for 30%, Norway, France, the uh, UK, et cetera. So they have a much higher level of board diversity in Europe than in America. We actually don't rate very high on the list, although I do think after the summer that math is going to change very dramatically. And I think companies will be really embarrassed if they don't have diversity. But the bottom line is I think that the California initiative was a bold idea. I think it was a good idea. I think it got people's attention. And more importantly, I think leaders are now saying to themselves, I don't want to be on these lists where I I, I show up, you know, empty handed when it comes to be an inclusive being a, an inclusive environment. That's great. Um Thanks, thanks for that. We actually had on, on the Jerry Brown front, we had him speak at CEPA a couple of years ago, to, uh, just a, a month or two before he stepped down as California governor. But he, uh, I, I know a number of the people who are watching here today enjoyed enjoyed hearing, hearing from him then. So I wanna uh, pivot again in a slightly different direction. So you and your husband, the filmmaker uh, George Lucas were awarded the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy in 2019. And your family foundation also uh, recently made a major gift to your alma mater, Princeton University to establish a new residential college. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your views on the role of philanthropy today and the strategies for determining how to make the best possible charitable investments. Well, first of all, in America, philanthropy is, it's quintessentially America. The rest of the world is not like us. The rest of the world is not as giving as we are here. It's a, a part of the culture. Um, churches, they have tithing, you have all forms of philanthropy show up in America in a very uh, unique way, which gives me so much hope about just humanity and our culture because we do come through for each other, especially in tough times like we've seen of late. There's corporate giving, um, obviously individual giving and the like. When it came to the gift to Princeton, for Hobson College, it was us making a statement. And it was the idea of the president, Chris Eisberger, who, who really made a point about the fact that um, he recognized that the Woodrow Wilson College, which exists at Princeton as one of our residential colleges, does not the name does not live up to the ideals of the university today. And this all came out of a speech that I gave at Princeton when I received the Woodrow Wilson Award, which is the highest award you can get as an alum of Princeton. And when you have to give a lecture when you get the award, and I gave a lecture and I started off by saying I found myself really challenged with the idea of receiving an award for someone who wouldn't have wanted me at the university. And I made a joke that Woodrow Wilson did not believe that orange went with black, which is you know the colors of our school. And the university really picked up on it right away and saw the the irony and the the you know the injustice in in the system in that regard. So they came to us and they said, "What if we we're going to tear down Woodrow Wilson College because we have to build a new college, which is a set of buildings for the residents, for the undergraduates, and we want to name it Hobson College because we don't really have a statement like that on the university campus that is named after a black woman." We have a we had a building at Princeton named for Toni Morrison, which was the registrar's office, West College, but nothing like this. And so when we heard the opportunity, we decided to do it not out of you know vanity for me, but it was more about showing those students who are like me, who show up at Princeton, who come from only parents, who struggled, who may question belonging, that they see Rockefeller and Forbes and Hobson and they say, I belong here. So it was to change the narrative and let people know your past doesn't have to be your future, both of Princeton, as well as for the young people, maybe who come from disadvantaged situations like myself who arrive on that campus. That's, yeah, that must have been amazing. And I know that we, we hear a lot about Princeton. They're in our orbit a lot because we're frequently competing with them for graduate students and faculty and so forth. And so I'm, I'm happy, but sometimes a, a little <laughs> frustrated to see them thriving uh, so much. So, but that uh, congratulations on that amazing uh, investment. So I wanna talk uh, now about another topic that has come up a fair amount in, certainly in the news and, and uh, certainly a lot in my Econ 1 class. And I try to give the students a sense of this is um, there's a lot of talk about income and wealth inequality 
in the US. And um, maybe I'm curious to hear your perspective on how pernicious it is and what can or should be done by governments, by businesses and others. Um, it's a bad situation. I mean, there's no question about it. And, uh, you know, there's the statistics again, I'm back to math having no opinion. The statistics are so bad. So there's math that shows that a college educated African-American in their lifetime is likely to make less than a white American who graduated from high school. And there's just something wrong with that math that, that we are so disadvantaged in the opportunities that present themselves in our society that even with doing the right thing, studying really hard and graduating and going to college, we're on the back foot. You know, we, are, we, we will underperform a person who woke up that way and didn't put in that time and energy and that expense. And that's just really wrong and discouraging. We've done a lot of research, which we released last week around black investing and the difference between African-Americans and white when it comes to saving and investing. And so much is it, of our lack of investment and lack of participation, we were talking about 401k plans earlier, is tied to some of the strains on our resources that we have with taking care of family, taking care of aging parents, adult children, um, extended family members and the like, that when we have arrived, when we do get that good job, that so many in our family are counting on our support. And so therefore we do support them at the expense of our own retirement security. And again, you just create this vicious circle. It just keeps happening over and over again. So this wealth inequality issue is the issue. The solve for racial inequality in this country is economic. And people were in the streets this summer because economic inequality did not allow them to have the opportunity they, they dream for, hope for, and that America is known for. And until we directly address that and get it right, which is why we need diversity inside of boardrooms, is why we need diverse leadership teams so that people can look up and see the opportunity and wanna be a part and believe they can be a part of a system that is fair and just. So economic equality is the issue, in my view, right now. Yeah, I agree. And I spend a ton of time of it, time on this topic in, uh, in my Ecom One class. And I, I guess one thing I'm curious about, as you, as you look at it, I, you know, I remember uh, President Obama used to talk about an all of the above strategy for, for energy, uh, like for energy production. I'm curious on this note, on the inequality, do you sort of think in all of the above, like schools and policies and so forth, is there any area of economic policy that you think has the greatest potential to move the needle in a real a significant way? I think there has to be support of Black and Latinx businesses in this country. And that has to be very, very targeted. And that is where you can actually scale change. And that has largely not been in existence. And I say that because I talk to people about the fact, okay, scholarships have been given, philanthropy has been directed in this area, but I really challenge a lot of philanthropists and I say, you've been aligned with issues of race and education, et cetera. But if I look inside of your organization, the place where you work, I don't see any people of color. So there's a disconnect there. How do you compartmentalize that? because the DNA of the person who is about change and equality and fairness would see that inequality in their own environment and say, I need to solve for that. So because of that, I think we really need to think about minority business and making sure minority business has an opportunity to compete. And that's actually one of the things we've just started working on at Ariel and announcing our launch of Ariel Alternatives and a new effort called Project Black, where our goal is to scale sustainable minority businesses in a way that has never been done before. And to look at it with a whole new lens and a whole new paradigm um, from a private equity perspective. And to solve for two things, because we think that oftentimes when Black and Latinx businesses are discussed, people constantly talk about access to capital, access to capital. Yes, that is important. But we would say access to customers is equally important. And we talk about the fact that if you can marry capital with customers, that creates a winning formula for minority businesses to thrive. And so what we've been trying to do with Project Black is to create an opportunity to marry minority businesses that of scale that can become tier one suppliers to Fortune 500 companies. So they have the capital, 
and the customer embedded in their business model, and it ultimately will lead to more success. We have to create more successful people of color in this country, which again creates a ripple effect. We saw some of that back in the 70s and 80s. There were some black businesses like Johnson Publishing Company, Johnson Products Company. Um, there were a number of businesses that really became anchors in the community. And as anchors in the community, they really did lead to great prosperity for those people who work for those companies. At one point, Johnson Publishing Company had 2,000 people working for them, all really good jobs in publishing and in running their magazines. That has to be replicated in this country for us to really see the kind of economic progress that we think is necessary. So not just in corporate America, which we think is super important, but also creating a, a viable, scaled group of business leaders out there running, running sizable businesses that can shift the paradigm um, for corporate America. That's great. That's uh, really uh helpful insights for me. I, so I, I want to pull some because we've got a bunch of questions coming in from the audience and I have more for myself too, but I want to get make sure to get some from the audience. So uh, from one of our board members uh, have the following question uh, follows up on one of your earlier points. I do believe that diversity yields better outcomes, but I don't believe that I have the math to necessarily measure that view. What math should I cite? So there, there are a lot of studies on this. One of my favorite books is from Scott Page, who's a professor at the University of Michigan. The book is called The Difference. And I can't quote the stats off the top of my head, but there is data on stock market performance of companies with no diversity on their board versus one diverse board member versus two diverse board members. They've actually tracked that. And there is some law of numbers that suggests that more than one is actually better. The lone director um, becomes an can be an island versus if you have more than one diverse people persons in the room, people in the room, it creates a, a different outcome. So the data is out there. I'm sorry, I can't just quote it for you right now, but it's really shows up in the investment returns for those companies. Okay, great. And we, from another uh, board member, we uh, also uh, she suggested that we, that, uh, the audience and and others take a look at the Acceleration Project, which was started by a, a Harvard Business School friend of hers, uh, and it sounds sort of consistent with what you're uh, with, with what you're talking about. Okay, another question: uh, Companies can issue hollow statements of support in regard to issues such as board diversity and climate change without committing to any lasting changes. In your opinion, should shareholders of the company be the ones to band together and hold the company leadership accountable in this situation? Thank you. I think that's already happening. So I think when you see the, the letters that have been written by Larry Fink, where he's talked very clearly about the role and responsibility of the corporation. I think when you're seeing the kind of activism that has occurred from big pension funds and the like around issues of not supporting slates that are non-diverse or not supporting board initiatives that go against some of their core values, I think people are voting with their feet. And that proxy voting has changed dramatically over the last 20, 30 years. And I think that that is holding companies more accountable and making a difference. So I think that is already happening. It's great, super, uh, super helpful. So uh, I have an, uh, another uh, comment from an audience person. Uh, thank you, Melody and Mark for this presentation. I am a firm believer also of early financial literacy and I try to bring my daughter into the financial conversation at home. So she is at least hearing some terms. Uh, I was wondering, are there any resources in your institutions to mentor young minds in financial literacy? Yes. So um, two things. One, the story of Ariel is a really powerful story about financial literacy. And I'll just take a minute to tell you it, not as an advertisement, but hopefully as, a, as an inspirational thought. My business partner, John Rogers, started our company when he was 24 years old. Now out in Silicon Valley, I know that's like no big deal. But in 1983, he was the first black person to start an investment firm. And 24 was shocking. He's calling on big pension funds, asking them to manage money with no experience and no money under management. But this was born out of a childhood hobby. His father, who was a child of the depression himself, first class of Tuskegee Airmen who were fighter pilots in World War II, 
his father had a mission of teaching John about money based upon his own experience growing up with depravity. So a lot of similarities. And John's father gave him stocks every birthday and every Christmas starting when he was 12 years old instead of toys. He said in the beginning, it wasn't very fun. He'd run to the Christmas tree and the only thing he had was a white envelope. And he said, the worst part, worst, is that on Christmas day, your friends call you and ask you what you got for Christmas. And he said, they would say, I got Monopoly or GI Joe. And he would say, I got four shares of IBM. But his father did something really smart. He allowed him to keep the dividend checks from these blue chip stocks he was buying, modest portfolio. And John said, when you're 12 years old, one thing you don't get is mail and checks with your name on them. So that was exciting. And the other thing, it didn't matter if it was 50 cents or $50, he had this freedom. He was a 12 year old with cash flow. If he wanted to buy a candy bar, he could. So this childhood hobby turned into an obsession that became our company. So his 12 year old stock picking became the profession that he has been in and now he's 62 years old. So that story is relevant because we say every parent could replicate this. They could think about the things that their child loves. And instead of just all toys, you maybe don't have to be extreme as John's father was, maybe instead of all toys, there is some portion of Christmas or birthday, et cetera, gifts that Hanukkah and the like that are stocks. So if you have a little girl, like I have a seven-year-old, she's not really into Barbies, but maybe Mattel would have been something for your seven-year-old, or she loves Legos or you know, although they're not publicly traded, but you get the idea, you find stocks, you might have teens that love sneakers and Nike becomes a great buy for you, which of course has been a great stock or all teens, teens love phones and what's been hotter than Apple went up 20 uh, in 23 weeks, a trillion dollars last summer. So did you get the idea that you can create, we think almost the, in the way that um, 10 year old boys used to love baseball stats that you create this fascination with the stock market and the tracking of it. And it almost becomes like sports and literally having that long-term perspective acclimates them to this subject of money working for them and growing over time. And also obviously there are setbacks and disappointments that will come along the way with those stock picks as well. So that's one thing we think you can replicate. Sorry for such a long answer, but I think that John's story brings it to life. We've also at Ariel, we have a school called the Ariel Community Academy, and we have a saving and investment curriculum. And we give $20,000 to every first grade class. And that money follows them through their grade school career with them taking increasing responsibilities for managing it. When they're in eighth grade, they give $20,000 back to the incoming first grade class to make the program self-perpetuating. And for the profits that are left over, 80% of our kids are on free or subsidized lunch. We want them to be philanthropists. So they have to use half of the profits to make a gift to their school and the other half they split amongst themselves. And for every child that will put their money in a 529 plan, we match it another $500 to teach them when you get the option of a match, don't walk away from the free money. Now, we developed a financial curriculum around that work. It's called Financial Futures and it's a curriculum for grade schools. So if someone had an interest in that, we'd be happy to share it with them. We've completely printed up workbooks and everything else to make it something that is um, able to be shared. That's terrific. Uh, so, and we've got a bunch more questions here and I just wanna remind audience, feel free to keep, uh, keep sending them in. But we have, um, there's a lot of investment news lately on things that you could refer to as almost fads. Um, and so one thing that we've talked about a little bit in Ecom One is GameStop. And I, I don't have the answers to GameStop, but for someone who doesn't have good financial literacy, uh, that, something like that can seem attractive, but it can also get them into trouble. Um, and so how, how do you go about making sure that people um, think to have a balanced investment portfolio uh, or that they don't just start investing when there's a bubble that can end up hurting them ultimately? Well, your students who are so, so smart, I mean, there's no question about it. You know, I love teaching history. If you can see the history of fads and bubbles, you learn very, very quickly how those speculative more moments do not ever end well. They don't, there's no, there is no example in history of these things that don't make sense suddenly making sense. 
And there are a lot of books that really speak to these issues. Um, you know, the tulip mania that occurred in Holland. There are so many things that have happened over the years. And I've just read those books with great interest. When I started at Ariel, I read The Money Masters, um, which was a book that John Rogers rec recommended to me, which was about money managers. And in that, they had some examples of great fads that had occurred. We read everything Warren Buffett writes, and certainly Charlie Munger has been very prolific in this subject in recent days around what's going on at GameStop and how concerned he is. Um, so we just think history really, really helps. If it's too good to be true, it completely is. Money does not compound like this. You go back to the very basics about compound interest. This does not make sense. Nothing works like that. So I have this quote that I always remember that I read one money manager say when I was really new to the, my career, he said, if it grows like a weed, it is a weed. We wanna be in the oak business. You know, these are, these are just weeds that are growing. They grow really, really fast, but this is not, you know, something that is sustainable. So I would tell your students to just make sure they, they read and study history. When you, when you speculate in this way, I just promise you it will, it will not end well. Okay, this is great. So we have a couple of questions uh, that have come in, and this is a, a topic that we hear a lot about the, in, in the news right now, given uh, uh, President Biden's uh, package on the, uh, on the minimum wage. And I just wanna give a little bit of background because there are two economists at nearby uh, UC Berkeley at the uh, School of Public Policy there, who've done this research looking back as far back as the 1960s and early 70s, arguing that minimum wage increases helped to uh, reduce inequalities between white and black workers, which have remained stubbornly high, uh, partly as the minimum wage has stayed flat. So the question that came in was, what's the impact on financial literacy and income inequality and diversity of doubling the minimum wage, which is currently being uh, proposed at the federal level from 725 to 15. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but it, multiple questions, so sort of from different, from different angles. So minimum wage discuss. <laughs> That's a... So I don't know if I have data or information around the, the direct impact to financial literacy, but I do from, think from an income inequality perspective, the math is pretty clear. I think that I always think about less about minimum wage and more about living wage. And you want to make sure that when you think about wages, you take into consideration geography, um, the cost of living in that community, et cetera, because $15 an hour in San Francisco is not the same as $15 an hour in Selma. And so we just need to be very clear about that and what the implications of it are. But overall, I have to say that it's the minimum wage discussion is a super interesting one. Um, if you just index from the last time we had an, uh, an increase in minimum wage, which was in the early, the, the mid to late zeros, um, you'd be at $11. So it, it, has, it has not kept, place with kept pace with inflation. The other thing which is interesting to me is I've been studying, a, reading a lot about the Great Depression during the summer when we were going through the the, the worst of the pandemic, just trying to think through worst case scenarios. What is possible? What could happen again? One of the things when you read about the history and what FDR did during that time, you recognize that there are a lot of reasons that that could not happen again, mostly because we didn't even have financial constructs in place and governance in place to protect the system the way it is protected today. They were figuring that all out in real time. But what he did do was he partnered with corporate America and specifically the minimum wage was doubled during the Great Depression in the early 30s by Henry Ford. It was $2.50 an hour and he went to $5 on the factory floor. And it was, you know, when you would never think anyone would double something. I mean, it just, that was pretty aggressive. Part of his theory was that he wanted the factory workers to be able to afford a car. So he thought he would actually sell more cars. He was doing something that he thought was in his own, it wasn't to be super generous. It was just in his own best interest to have workers who made more money. And ultimately that obviously proved to be true. So it's just one data point, uh, which there are many to look at and to consider, but it does just help you think about where some of the fears are and then where some of the facts and reality 
uh, lie. So again, like looking at if you had indexed from, I think it's 08, 09, the last time the, the, the minimum wage was raised, where we would be today. Yeah, it's so interesting that you uh, raised that because just on Friday in my class, we talked about this research coming out of uh, Harvard and Boston University that uh, made the point that during the pandemic, more than 7 million people in the US have seen their wages cut not to mention the 23 million who lost jobs as a result of COVID. And then a number of other people uh, places freezing salaries, but that some employers had gone in the opposite direction, partly had, had actually tried to increase wages for their workers and that they um, did it for the same sort of business case that you're suggesting Henry Ford did it, that they their hypothesis was that by doing this, workers were really gonna feel like uh, their employers were looking out for them and work extra hard for them. And you know they, they felt very good about that uh, looking back on it. So in any case, um, you know, you mentioned in there the pandemic and obviously we're, you know, it's been a, it, it's been an incredible year. We, we uh, as, as we mentioned before getting on this event, we, you were supposed to speak a year ago and the world has changed a lot since, since then. Uh, I'm so grateful to you for coming back, uh, you know, a year later, but in that time we've had the pandemic and it has, um, it has had a lot of effects and curious to hear your, um, take on what that has done for this sort of some of these inequities that you're talking about and financial well-being. I think it's, you know, we've talked a little bit about the K-shaped recession. Maybe it's been good for the high end and not so good for uh, workers, but maybe you can talk a little bit about your, your what you're seeing. Uh, I think the gap has widened pretty dramatically between the have and have nots. And it's apparent. I mean, you have a stock market that is reaching all-time highs basically every day. And so those who have wealth in the stock market are seeing that wealth compound in ways that again, I think many are even shocked about. And at the same time, you have those who are suffering there, you know, the food lines in this country, the food insecurity, 17 million children in this country are food insecure every single day compounded by the fact that they're not getting food in school, which have been a, a lifeline for so many, um, that you're seeing numbers that are, are truly staggering. And the number of people who have fallen into poverty during this period is unprecedented. We've never seen numbers like this so fast. I think we have to be really honest with ourselves about where we are. And I think we have to hold ourselves accountable for the outcomes from here. No one could have imagined what we were about to undertake as a society and as a world. So there's no blame, but we have to be clear about the fact that a lot of people need help. And so I, for one, have been a big believer in the stimulus package and that it is needed. I think it could be more targeted in some ways um, as opposed to as blanket as it's been done. But the actual idea is something that is desperately, desperately needed for people who don't have anything. The one thing that I'm grateful for about the tough childhood that I have, yes, it gave me this, this desire and knowledge and, and real um, uh, search for truth when it comes to money but it also gives me tremendous empathy for those who are struggling. I know what it is like. I know what it feels like. I know the sense of anxiety and, and, and loss that comes during this period. And that is what definitely motivates me to speak out on making sure that we look after those who through no fault of their own find themselves really, really struggling. Sorry, there I had an issue with unmuting. Thank you so much for that. And yeah, I've, I've talked about that a little bit in my class this quarter too. The notion of if you yourself struggle, you can understand a little better what other people are going through. And you know, I, when I was an undergrad at MIT, we were in the early '90s recession, and my dad lost his job. And MIT was very nice, and they kicked in financial aid so that I could stay uh, there. And I know that a lot of them are suffering, you know, disruptions. Even the Stanford uh, students, a lot of them are suffering disruptions. So I think it has, I think probably given all of us a bit more empathy uh, during uh, the past year, uh, seeing all the struggles that people are having. Um, so one question, this is from a completely different direction, but I've got it from multiple people in the audience. So I just want to ask it regards cryptocurrencies. Uh, so, and you are a very knowledgeable person in the investment world and you've probably been hearing a bit about Bitcoin and, and so forth. So do you, the, the, the one question was, do you regard cryptocurrencies as weeds? Um, that, that was how they- uh, Well, that's a great question. I mean, the way to, to, I think that the actual technology of blockchain is something that is here to stay and will be very, very useful in society. Um, 
if you talk about a specific currency like Bitcoin, et cetera, I don't necessarily subscribe to those and some of the, again, speculative nature of how those those currencies are trading. Um, that's just not my thing. And I, you know, I play the long game. It's not about catching a fad. It's about moats, as Warren Buffett would say. What is the, the competitive advantage that exists? Um, and so uh, I do think the, I, I don't, I think that, that blockchain will be a part of what we do in lots and lots of ways. Uh, I'm not one to endorse, endorse Bitcoin, for example, uh, in and of itself. And I would not, you know, be speculating in Bitcoin personally and haven't. Okay, uh, I'm on the same uh, page, but it, but it is it, it has come up a lot. It is a topic of common uh, conversation. So I have. I, we have a lot of questions. I'm going to just try to harness uh, uh, one more, and then I have one final one for for students. So, um, we want to get your take a little bit on the future of work, especially in retail and customer service. Um, at some at a high level, will more or fewer people be needed to work at places like Starbucks as innovation brings about more automation? I will tell you that's not how we think about it. And um, we start with, first of all, solving for what is the best experience for the customer and how can we exceed their expectations and give them a wonderful experience. And so we don't start with how do we streamline uh, the number of people that we have behind a counter. We say, do we have the right number of people behind a counter and those people serving a purpose that makes that experience better for the customer? Um, I think that's the way most business people are thinking. They want to be efficient and smart, and uh, they don't want to do it in a way that ultimately um, is too risky. I mean, we saw a lot of businesses, there was in the in the early zeros, there was a lot of out, offshoring of jobs and outsourcing things like, um, you know, phone uh, data banks and things like that. And that was a big move. And then people brought it back when they realized all of the sort of cultural challenges that were occurring and questions that weren't quite understood and lingo, et cetera. So I think you can overcorrect on some of these things. At the end of the day, however, I wanna be very clear, technology is going to continue to disintermediate and disrupt our world in a meaningful way at every level, every organization. And so there will be less people doing things but it won't be just a retail story. I think it will be just a, a, a life situation. I think the hope that many of us have who look at the economy is that, you know, in, the, in that sort of freeing up, it will, as you said, help us to deliver a better product and allow and open up new opportunities that aren't necessarily currently available. This is really important because I think we get so tied to what will be lost for, I'm always thinking about what will be gained. There's so much that doesn't exist that you, you know, if you were in at the turn of the last century, you know, let's go to the, the 1900s, 1800s to 1900s. I think if you'd said they're going to be something called masseu masseurs and masseuses, you would say like, what are you talking about? Like, you're not going to have someone rub your body. That's a job. You know, there are things that we can't even fathom that will come. We obviously don't have people who drive buggies anymore. So we there is a sense of hanging on at times that I think holds us back, as opposed to staying open to what, what will be created that will lead to new opportunities and new jobs and enrich people's lives in ways that they had not expected. Great, thank you so much, Melody. And I guess, uh, uh, one final question for you. So there are, as I mentioned, a number of students uh, watching today, uh, including my Ecom One students and other Stanford students. And I'm just curious, do you have uh, any advice for them as they both try to navigate this pandemic, which has been uh, not the ideal way for many of them to start off college, uh, but just think about their futures? I actually have a very, um, something I feel strongly about because I've talked to a lot of young people who talk about you know, how they feel that this time has been unfair for them, that they, you know, they are going to college and it's not the real college experience and what have you. And I just think perspective is super important. When this pandemic started, my husband said to me, I was complaining one day and he said, Melody, during World War II, people lived in bunkers for five years, five. 
They were living on rations. They were getting scraps of information on slips of paper. There were no newspapers. Five years, get some perspective. And so I would say to the young people, not in a finger wagging way, but just to understand all the opportunity that this stress, this anxiety, this difficult time is going to make you more resilient when you go out into the world and have to fight the good fight and you will be better for it, even though it's hard to imagine. So take this as a, a, an opportunity. You know, every crisis creates great opportunity. Understand this opportunity will most likely help you in ways that you could never imagine. Well, well, thank you uh, so much, Melody. I'm really sorry to say that we are, it looks like we're almost out of time and I just can't thank you enough for being with us here today and sharing all of your thoughts and your insights. Um, it's really been tremendous and especially grateful since you had agreed to do it last year and came back a year later when we had to cancel for the first time ever. And I hope you can come back with us sometime soon. And thanks also to all of you who tuned in for this session. We have a CEPR Associate exclusive session starting right after this, featuring a conversation moderated by CEPR's Deputy Director, Gopi Shah Goda, and our senior fellows, John Chauvin and Michael Boskin about their own work around financial literacy that will hopefully uh, build on uh, today's discussion. And uh, they'll be teaching about a class that they teach here at Stanford on financial literacy. So if you're registered to attend that event, please make sure to join us on the Summit virtual event platform via the link in your confirmation email. And I hope you can all make it back for day two of the summit tomorrow when we will uh, welcome Gene Sykes, who will be moderating a panel exploring the limits of antitrust policy in the era of big tech. Thank you so, so much again, Melody. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And I hope to see you again very soon. All clear. Thank you guys so much.